White genocide. Is it a thing? Well, some people will gaslight you even for claiming that white extinction is a threat. That we're under demographic um, threat or facing any kind of demographic danger. But this is nonsense because... There is no white population in any white western developed nation that is making replacement level fertility, 2.1 children per mother. And if you're not making replacement level fertility, your population is going to decline. That's just a mathematical certainty. And if your population declines long enough, it's going to disappear. You know, if you continue declining indefinitely, you're going to go to zero eventually. It's just a matter of time. It doesn't matter how long it takes, it's going to happen if you stay below replacement and don't get back above replacement. That's just a mathematical certainty. So, you know, there is a demographic danger for sure. And, uh, you know, this is compounded in a democracy where if you slip into minority status, then you lose sovereignty and you become subject to the majority or a coalition of other minorities who can muster against you and it's you know pretty obvious mustering against whitey that's a pretty obvious shelling point that anybody else can get behind and um, you know it's pretty obvious where the loot is where the plunder is where the booty is you know and you're always going to assemble in a democracy the ruling coalition is always going to be the most parasitic and least productive coalition because that's the cheapest coalition to assemble, right? The votes of productive people are tremendously expensive. You have to take, you have to not take most of their stuff in order to obtain their votes. Whereas, you know, if you do take their stuff, you can buy a lot more votes from dependent parasites. So, um, you know, that demographic uh, collapse is a lot more dangerous under a democratic system or democratic values than it would be even otherwise. But you know, it's always a concern if you're losing ground relative to others, you are losing power, you're losing safety. And so this is a real concern. Now then the question becomes, you know, is this happening on purpose? Are people making this happen? Or is it happening um, kind of by accident, so to speak? And I think it's a combination of both. Really this is an emergent conspiracy. There wasn't a group of people that got together and decided to exterminate the white race. But you have a lot of different people with a lot of different agendas, many of them hostile, many of them parasitic, and taken together that's more or less what it amounts to. It amounts to a program of eventual extermination. And so chief among these is feminism. And that's uh, largely responsible for reducing uh, reproduction below replacement level fertility because it teaches women, feminism teaches women not to prize motherhood, not to value reproduction, but to seek other things instead. Education, career, you know, various other benefits or accomplishments. Mostly it involves begging for benefits and entitlements and handouts. And, uh, you know, chief among these are abortion and birth control, which... I don't really understand the birth control thing. It's like 20 to $50 a week for birth control for women. And, uh, you know, there's several things that cost me at least that much that I pay for myself. So I don't understand what the difficulty is, but apparently it's a really big deal. And that's an unreasonable burden to impose on women. So now we are, you know, supposed to pay for it for some reason. Um, but it's no coincidence that abortion and birth control are big planks of the feminist program because, you know, feminism is intrinsically hostile to motherhood and to reproduction. And then you have others like, um, you know, there's actually a philosophy called antinatalism, which posits that it is, you know, wrong to bring a life into the world because life is suffering and pain. And so therefore it's wrong to impose that on somebody without their uh, consent. And this is pretty stupid. Um, Antinatalism hardly merits a serious response because it's obviously not a philosophy that can take off. It's obviously a maladaptive philosophy. And if there's any heritable component to antinatalism or 
uh, susceptibility to antinatalism, then uh, it's just going to be weeded out of the population because every successive generation is going to be descended, you know, disproportionately from natalists rather than from antinatalists. And so this suggests there's some flaw in the philosophy. And, you know, the flaw in the antinatalist philosophy is pretty obvious, you know, that the assumption that suffering is bad. Um, and, you know, suffering is a fact of life. As Jordan Peterson would say, it is um, a natural consequence of being a limited entity in a, in, a, in a vastly larger and more complex universe, right? So sometimes things aren't going to go your way. They're not going to turn out how you expect. And that leads to suffering. So, um, you know, it's an inescapable feature of life, yes, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it's, it's something that can guide you you know, from unhealthy or unproductive or, um, you know, maladaptive behavior towards more healthy and more productive and more adaptive behavior. And that's the evolutionary kind of purpose, so to speak, of suffering and pain. Uh, so it's not necessarily a bad thing. And that's a faulty assumption. And then to, you know, leap from there to, you know, therefore you shouldn't have children is a, is a faulty, uh, you know, it's a non sequitur. Because, you know, you're doing the whole uh, from an is to an ought thing. And uh, it just doesn't follow. And, and you never hear this from people who are really suffering. You know, this antinatalist philosophy, you know, it isn't popular in Africa or the third world. Um, where people are, are really suffering, you know, pretty badly. You primarily hear this from spoiled Westerners who you know, have too much, um, material comfort and security and not enough real problems. So, you know, there might be some psychological angst there and I'm not going to discount, you know, the validity of their suffering, but, um, you know, you don't hear this from people who are really in pain, who are really struggling. You know, they're just happy to be alive and they're having as many kids as they can. So, um, you know, then there's the environmentalist thread. You know, how many times have you heard the, oh, well, the worst thing you can do for your carbon footprint is to have children. And, you know, the best way to reduce your carbon footprint is not to have children. And this is kind of nonsensical because, you know, again, white, western, first world people are like the people who are most concerned with environmentalism. And, um, the people who are most into environmentalism and any kind of, uh, you know, concept of maintaining the commons. That's a luxury, ultimately. Well, first of all, it's a cultural value, and it's a, uh, you know, it's a racial characteristic, the ability to care for and construct and maintain commons, but um, it's also a luxury, in this case, in, in the case of environmentalism, because you only engage in environmentalism when you can afford to. And so, you know, only people with a surplus of wealth or productivity are going to engage in environmentalism. If they're just trying to catch up with us, you know, they're going to burn as much coal as they want to. And that's what, you know, the Chinese are doing and the Indians are doing. And they're just trying to get up to the same standard that we are. And they're not going to stop for any kind of like environmental considerations. So, um, you know, if you're just refraining from having kids for environmental reasons, then all you're doing is, uh, you know, just like with antinatalism exterminating itself evolutionarily, you know, you're doing the same thing with environmentalism. And, uh, you know, the, the whole concept of overpopulation is kind of bogus. Um, you know, pop, overpopulation isn't a numerical value. It's not like a hard number. It's, uh, you know, there are people who are productive and positive some, and there are people who are parasitic and they're negative some and destructive. And, um, you know, the people in the latter category, those people are overpopulation. Even if there's only one of them, that person is still overpopulation. And, uh, you know, on the other hand, if you have productive, positive some people, then, uh, you know, they're not overpopulation. And we're definitely not overpopulated with productive, positive some people. So, you know, that's, that's a nonsense argument. Uh, you know, there are some others, the diversity tax, right? The multiculturalism tax. That's a tax that falls 
only on white people. You know, we have to pay the cost of including non-whites in our countries, in our firms, in our organizations, everywhere. Um, they can have their own countries, they can have their own firms, they can have their own organizations that don't have to include us. They don't have to pay any kind of diversity tax or multiculturalism tax. You know, they can maintain the benefits of ethnocentrism even in our own countries, um, whereas we have to pay that tax on their behalf for their benefit. And that's a, that's a tax that only goes one way. So if there's a burden that we're bearing and they're not, then, uh, you know, that's putting us at a competitive disadvantage. And you put us at a competitive disadvantage, then our numbers are going to decline relative to theirs, or at least faster than they would, you know, under any other circumstances. So that's a, a policy that has implications for white, white genocide. And there are just a bunch of these policies that, um, you know, are detrimental to white people in particular. And, um, you know, to white people specifically and not to others. And so, does this amount to a program of systematic genocide? Well, you know, there are some documents like the UN Human Rights Charter where they define genocide as, you know, being, uh, you know, making it difficult for people to reproduce and stuff. So, under that definition, then yeah, it constitutes genocide. But, you know, there are also enough headlines. You can look around and you can find headlines where people are gloating or celebrating about the... Uh, decline of traditional white majorities in traditional white countries and what those implications are for like politics and stuff you know up until Trump anyway basically the uh, progressives were dancing on our graves and and uh, celebrating our demise and that you know traditional white America would never win another election again and so they know they know what's going on and they can't claim you know to deny that they know if they're celebrating it openly. So, um, yeah, I would say there's definitely a case there. And it definitely rises at least to the case of, you know, the status of general intent, which is a form of, um, you know, criminal intent in criminal law. It's not necessarily specific intent, but the general intent is there because they know what's going on and they don't want to stop it. They just want to double down. They want to celebrate it. They want to keep going to the end.